Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nobel Week Dialogue. I think we can promise a day full of excitement that will stimulate your thinking and imagination. Alfred Nobel had high ambitions for his prize. He wanted the prizes that bear his name to contribute to the greatest benefit of mankind. Today we are doing this by organizing the first Nobel Week Dialogue. The 20th century, when people look back from many centuries from now, will clearly be known as the information century, because it turned out quite unexpectedly to those at the beginning of the 20th century that life was fundamentally about information, that information was encoded in organisms. I end with a quote by Amartya Sen, what should keep us awake at night, the tragedies that we can prevent, the injustice that we can repair. Thank you. What was the thinking behind writing The Double Helix? <laughs> to girls, I would tell them the story, you know, try and make myself interesting to them. So, <laughs> you know, I had, <laughs> the story was, uh, uh, Within a year of writing the book, you'd got married. <laughs> no, 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 uh, I mean, uh, within a month of its publication, I within got married. <laughs> and, uh, so it worked? Yeah, it, you know, we're still married 45 years later, so it was uh, enormous success. Uh, <laughs> We've been modifying plants and animals for over 4,000 years. Most people put a lot of harm to GMOs, which are not caused by GMOs at all. Welcome to panel 2A, which, in which we're going to discuss genetics in agriculture and the environment. What are the pros and cons of genetic modification? We're going to need to produce about 70% more food than we have today. One of the main problems is that we generalize too much about GM crops. And I think what we should do as scientists is explain exactly these details. So the issue of risk, in other ways, really has to be uh, communicated in a much more detailed fashion. How many of you would like to have your genome sequenced? This is about 60%. Yeah, he's side. an optimist. Joe says 30 to 40%, so <laughs> I think 55. <laughs> In Russia, India, China, Brazil, South Africa, there's been, on average, about a 200% increase in the number of clinical trials that are now going out in the developing world. And let them decide their own risk. They're the ones that have cancer, not us. If they want a higher dose and are aware of the risks, why not give it to them? Yeah. So how far does that go, Bert? I mean, should, should we just then make those drugs available without approval at all? Because if they want it, they should be entitled no, to it? No, 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 of course not. So this is a general question that's shared by the online audience from Mumbai to Massachusetts. Is it possible to silence an extra chromosome at an embryonic level or even simply repress the expression of a gene to prevent the manifestation of diseases and syndromes? Can we make our DNA repair system more powerful? We have a question from a med student in Israel. So he's asking, what kind of drugs do you think we're going to have in the future? Do you think that the media supports your work and the process towards the market, or would you say it slows it down? Uh, I thought today's conference was fantastic. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for people 
in the community to talk and have a dialogue about really important scientific issues that are impacting all of mankind. Well, it's a really interesting uh, way to find uh, out what the top people in this field are thinking about. And I enjoyed talking with the other people on the panel and exchanging our views. And I learned a lot. Well, it was certainly stimulating. I thought the most exciting part was certainly the dialogue. Well, I thought there were a lot of wonderful ideas, a lot of very smart people uh, sort of getting together, exchanging ideas. You know, unless you have a, a dialogue when people can ask each other questions, you miss that key aspect of science. It's very different to normal scientific conferences where it's actually only scientists. I think it's very important to have all sorts of different participants, Nobel laureates, scientists, as well as students and general public, because what we often don't do is reach out to the public. It's been really encouraging to see how scientists can engage the public in, in these important discussions about science-related topics. It brings down um, science to the level where everybody could discuss, and actually it helps spread the message of science. The scientists have to do a better job of educating the public. We've reached the point where it is the difference between whether we deliver on this scientific promise or whether we have to explain to our children why we failed. What is going to cure some cancers are some combination of new therapies, immunotherapies, perhaps gene therapies, and mysterotherapies. A mysterotherapy is mysterious therapy that has yet to be invented. <laughs> now, who is going to invent it? It's going to be this people like in this audience, the young people, because only those people don't yet know what won't work. We senior investigators know what won't work, so we don't try it. Right? When you give young scientists the power to pursue their ideas and their curiosity, wonderful things happen. Bringing together social scientists, life scientists, medical professionals, uh, young people, I think it was wonderful. The format in general, I think, is unique. Um, and it was definitely worth continuing.